So when I think about uh, the title of this presentation, Passion for Words, I always have the idea of this blank white page. Uh, this blank white page is a kind of area for me. It is uh, an area for, yeah, passion. But it is something uh, that gives me fear. Sometimes this white blank page gives me uh, freedom, sometimes anger, sometimes exhaustion, sometimes happiness, sometimes agony. Because when you face first with this white blank page, you don't know what to do. I think my passion and my fear starts at the same time. But as soon as I started to write words within this page, now my life starts. And this is the life of a poet, I think. And I'm still writing by handwriting, not uh, directly into the computer. I have lots of uh, notebooks. So always when I think about poems and when I think about words, I have this image of white blank paper which gives me tons of different emotions. So I really don't know where to start because I have lots of stuff to, to, to share with you. But then I decided to share mostly um, some stories with you. Of course, they will be uh, com completed with my ideas about poetics and maybe a little bit kind of, not intro, introduction, but the kind of information about Turkish poetry, a very uh, short one. Um, I mean, the historical tradition, why poetry is so vital for Turkey still, why it is one of the um, best artworks, art types that people still uh, sharing, reading, and uh, they say they, they love poetry. So I, okay, my father and my mother, I was born in a very small district in Turkey. It is called Burdur Tefenni, um, which is a very small, peaceful uh, place within nature, just like here in Tranos. So that's why I feel here as if I was at my ho home and uh, Tranos becomes my second home now. So I am the only child of the family and my father is a respected, uh, established philosophy teacher. And uh, this is my luck maybe because I was born into a house within this small district with a great library. <laughs> okay, nearly like this. <laughs> And I'm very happy that I'm now in the library because I can hear all the voices from these uh, books coming me. And um, books first are my toys. And my father is always reading books. So, um, of course, I'm in love with my father. Still, but sometimes we are quarreling a lot nowadays. But as a child, I was kind of trying to understand what he really loves doing when he uh, picks this thing and then you know he he just lost himself in it and I I watched his face I watched his body language I watched you know sometimes he laughed sometimes he made some different uh, facial expressions and I was so curious about what is going on in this two within between these two cover pages what is happening there? So even though I cannot know how to, uh, you know, do it, I'm just mimicking my father, just like, 
being so serious, da da da. And I started uh, reading very early before before I go to school. And uh, <coughs> Oops, sorry, no. And this is me, this naughty child. I fell always, you know, I was because I was running all the time. I was uh, always in the streets, in the forest, in the gardens, playing a lot. And uh, I love outdoors before I learn uh, reading. But afterwards, uh, I realize, okay, there are different worlds apart from my own world within these two book covers. So I can experience lots of different stuff without experiencing it myself, but just like as my father, I can now make similar kind of emotions. I can uh, get lost within a different kind of world. So oh, that's why I always want to emphasize and uh, love to say that even to my students is first I'm, a, I'm trying to be a creative, reflective reader because poetry teaches you a lot and you can teach you can learn poetry from strong poets not only uh, who are writing in Turkish but also who are writing in different languages in different countries because each each poet has it his own world and and this world uh, gives me another life I, I just uh, can use the word like birth death and rebirth when I am reading and I'm creating and writing things, um, I, I, I feel that I have another life. And this is the life where I am within reality, within the realm of reality, but it is not directly a daily uh, familiar reality that I know. It, it, it has another layer in itself and I want to um, create dialogues started from my childhood because as I was told you I'm the only child of the family and I'm kind of um, I don't have sisters or brothers so I'm alone okay I have lots of friends but still being alone uh, gives me the urge to to create bridges between different people different culture different languages so um, sorry my mother, okay, she kinds of, uh, you know, she, she likes reading, but not too much. She likes to be within nature. And she starts to, to become a poetry reader because she's detecting me. Because I was too young when I started uh, to, to publish my poems. I started to write between 10, 12, 13, but my fir first poem was published when I was 15 years old. And it was published in one of the uh, oldest Turkish literary magazine, Varlık. It's called Varlık, and this is something really to be published there, to be able to publish there by living, you know, from this little small city, is really something. And then they realize, my parents will realize sometimes, okay, she's doing some stuff, and people love this. Come on, and then uh, my mother really wants to know what I am writing about. And uh, at those time, I am writing some sexual stuff because I am dreaming some kind of, I don't know, the uh, naughty things, just like uh, what I did with my body all the time. So one day I finished the poem and just put it there on my table. And when I returned to home, she was so angry with me. She, was, she didn't talk with me. She didn't look at my face. And, and I say, okay, mother, what happened? And she says, come. She touched it like that. What is this? And I say, oh, this is my last poem. Do you read it? Do you like it? There is a line in the poem about her breasts. I mean, not her breasts, but it's breasts of my mother, something like this. And then she just throw it down and what are you writing about? What if someone who knows us will read about this? They will think about my breasts. What is your business with my breasts? 
Okay, this was the first shock that, um, you know, in my house, I, I tried to make my mother understand, okay, this is not, okay, I'm writing the breasts of my mother, but this mother is not directly you, it's all the mothers, you know, in the world that I'm trying to refer to, but no, she was so angry, she was so angry, but now she accepts me. Uh, then uh, sometimes she even uh, tells me that, okay, I love this, this work. But first, the, uh, the emotion that she uh, experienced uh, is shame and anger. And she's telling me if I had another child, I even wouldn't send her or him to the school. Because my father and, and me uh, have uh, our lives only with books and she everywhere in the house there are books and she's fed up with us really and and this is my daughter uh, she's now 12 years old and she's in a lake that uh, kind of teaches me lots of things not only life but also poetry as well and I will give you uh, in a minute a story about the lake, Lake of Burdur, and why lakes are so important for me. And uh, but before that, maybe I may say one or some other stuff about what I am kind of trying to uh, do with this aim of creating periods and dialogues with other people, other readers, other poets, writers. And it turns out to be within years. I have three, three books, by the way. This one, my first one, it was published when I was 18. And I was still in this small town. I didn't know any literary figures, any poets, editors, writers. But I participated in a, in a poetry competition. And uh, this book took the award. And then they published it. And it was the first year, 2000, when I uh, went to, to Istanbul for my university education. So 2000 means something in my life. I was 18. I was in a very big modern city, first time in my life. And um, I started to meet all these, you know, poets that I know before uh, because I was reading all of them in my small room and I, I thought I created some kind of dialogues or connection with them. Uh, but it was hard, I have to say. Okay, it, it is also rewarding, but it is also kind of hard thing for me to, as a very young female poet, to be able to um, create your, your own uh, identity between all these strong male, basically male figures, is a kind of threat. So then, I realized, okay, I have to uh, write more directly, maybe more subversively, more um, revolutionary, starting from my mother, who is ashamed of her body, her sexuality, her breasts, I mean, and now coming to my daughter, so I have to be the voices of these mothers and lots of daughters, and as you know, Turkey is now becoming a kind of more conservative, more religious country. And economically, we are about to corrupt as well. So within all these, you know, political turmoil, art, poetry gives me a kind of weapon. It gives me the strength. It gives me the, the, the energy, the identity, the, the way to escape within all these boundaries as a young person, as a female, as a mother, as a single mother, as a teacher and as a poet. So here uh, in Tranas and especially in the Fringe Festival, I realized how important especially is this international dialogue between other poets, writers, but at the same time between other artworks. So we are here throughout one week, we have lots of images you know, we have films, we have theater, we have performances, dance, literature, poetry, within different languages, uh, created by different artists. And this, you know, this, this dialogue kind of deconstruct, I think, the fear of the unknown. If you think about the Eastern and Western poetry, you know, literature, most of the time, 
uh, we don't have any more enough ideas about the contemporary poetry. What is, you know, I have so limited knowledge about what is going on in Sweden, for example, for a 40-year-old female poet. What is she writing about? What, what are her dreams or her fears? I, I, I have so little information and I'm sure for, for contemporary Turkish poetry, most of you have kind of limited knowledge and background information. So that's why I, I find it, you know, this, this connection is a way to overcome the fear of the unknown, the fear of the other, the fear of the strange, um, foreign, unusual, maybe alien and exotic. So if you only uh, spend some time looking at the covers of Turkish literary works that are published in any other Western countries, you will see in their cover page lots of exotic images. For example, you can see in a very modernist writer's novels cover page a mosque or a dancer, you know, Turkish ballet dancer or a kind of lokum or some, some Turkish man with moustaches. Even though the work itself is experimental and modernist and even, you know, um, we can say surrealist, all these images are always very ready, you know, and they, they reflect the ideology of how uh, the, the Turkish literature, Turkish poetry is seen from the other side. And most of the time when I was in the festivals by with, you know, discussions with the other poets, um, the questions that, that they face with are mostly related with their own arts, own poetry. But for me, the questions from the audience and sometimes even from the moderator always has to do with politics. Okay, am I free to write in Turkey as a female poet or uh, what about censorship or what is the political condition? Uh, what is this uh, fucking Erdogan is doing? All of this stuff. Okay, I have my own ideologies, of course. I have my own thoughts, but I'm sitting there as a poet, not as a politician or someone who, uh, who is uh, called to give a lesson about sociology or ideology. Do you see what I mean? It's really kind of hard to, to deal with. So that's why I uh, love this poetic bridge, this artistic bridge between myself and the other. And most of the time it doesn't have to be someone who is living because why I reading, why I writing poetry, I realize that I uh, have connections and I created dialogue between the dead poets as well. I can talk with Hafiz, for example, for a very long time. I can talk with Goethe. I can talk with uh, Emily Dickinson or Eliot or Ungaretti or Pablo Neruda, lots of different, you know, poets. From, and, and they are still telling me something. And, and this, I think, uh, gives us the, the opportunity to compare Eastern and Western artworks, po poetic works, and try to understand the similarities and differences with a, with a, clo with a close analysis. And that's why I can um, say that Poetry is a vital force. It can be my weapon most of the time. I feel like this. So, and in Turkey, it has a very, really long and rich past from oral literature to, to contemporary poetry. Uh, my great great grandmother, for example, is uh, most of the time she's illiterate and she's nomad. We are nomads originally, but she tells me fairy tales, but they are not fairy tales full of events. She's describing a bird for hours to me, you know, and this is so poetic and I still have her voice in my mind. Nothing happens in the fairy tale, you know, normally something should happen, da, da, da, there, there should be events, but no, she's only describing a bird for hours, you know, the colors, the feathers, the everything. So I think she's writing poetry in a sense. And uh, my great, uh, my, my grandmother, the, the mother of my father, is, um, is uh, using manis. They are short, lyrical, folk song stuff, just kind of similar with haikus, but very short ones, rhythmic ones. Uh, they are using rhymes. And I 
kind of uh, have all these oral tradition in me from my family as a tradition as well. And I'm also uh, very into uh, in folk songs. Uh, Dominique has called me as a singer, but I wish I could be a singer. But what I am doing now, because you know I didn't get the education, da da da. My education is based on English language and literature, and I finished my PhD as well at the same department. Um, but what I am doing is I am kind of taking some couplets, some lines from the uh, Turkish folk songs, and implement them into my poetry. And as soon as they give the microphone to me, the the, the right to to perform. Okay, I'm reading a poem and then I, in an instant I started to sing a song and then continue reading. So that's my way of deconstructing, um, you know, the limits, the boundaries and, and again creating another dialogue between different artworks. So uh, 1923 is the establishment of Turkish Republic. So that period is important for us because this, this led us to language reform in Turkey. So the language completely changed and we adopt the Latin alphabet and the government uh, was secularized and this brought a split with the literature of the past. For example, I can't read Divan poetry because the language is totally different and I have to kind of know um, Arabic, Persian and Ottoman uh, discourse, linguistic discourse, so that's why I always use dictionary while I'm trying to read and understand a Divan poetry. And most of the time, some of them are translated into Turkish. And this split gives kind of poetry a rising force because in uh, 20s, 1920s, Nazım Hikmet revolutionized Turkish poetry because he uh, not, not only by his themes, but also his usage of free verse technique. And I'm very happy that Lucy, uh, in her uh, presentation here, read a poem that was written for Nazım Hikmet. And some of you, uh, we, we talked about Oktay Rifat, Melih Cevdet. Uh, these are all the names coming from Turkish poetry, and some people are here uh, read and affected by the, those poets, which gives me a kind of really great happiness. And after this, in 1940s, we have Garip movement, first new movement, Garip movement. Uh, the, the forerunners are Orhan Veli, <coughs> Melih Cevdet Anday, Oktay Rifat, basically. And they are changing completely, again, following, kind of following Nazım Hikmet. They change lots of things. This time they are using daily language, they are using, you know, uh, everyday themes. And then their ideology is, okay, everyone can read, should read poetry. You don't have to be an intellectual uh, in order to understand or get the taste from a poem. So this is their poetic revolution in that sense by introducing uh, radical change. And they avoided this highly usage of metaphorical language. So in, in, uh, in the 50s, Second new movement as a reaction uh, to this Garip movement is very influential. Still, most of the contemporary Turkish poetry uh, po poets are under the effect of second new movement because they they uh, they disrupt language. So they have uh, lots of similarities coming from surrealist movements and Dada Dada movements, and they are highly experimental and kind of. Uh, that's why they are still, they affect the, the Turkish contemporary poets. So, um, Emily Dickinson writes, a word is that when it is said, some say. I say, it just begins to live that day. So, uh, okay, some words are there in poems while we are reading them as readers. We encounter with these words, but most of the time I feel there are unsaid words between the lines within a poem. And I am basically as a poet putting, trying to put more silence, more blank uh, areas for the readers, for my readers to, to create a dialogue, a creative dialogue together with us. Because the reading process is not very different from the writing process, I think. So why reading and why, 
while you are trying to understand a poem, you are kind of creating because your your your brain is uh, it works just like okay, it ha it doesn't have to be this in the same way as the poet uh, did, but still you are giving your own meaning to the text most of the time. You you are reacting to a poem by your own emotions and your own ideas, dreams, fears, whatever, and experiences, of course. So that's why I find poetry so revolutionary. Um, maybe some of you remember Gezi protests in Turkey, for example. Within Gezi protests, uh, it, it was a kind of reactionary movement against the government. Most of the young people are using lines from poems. They are writing all these lines in the walls and, you know, in, in every places. And, and poetry gives this force to people, you know, to, to, to act, to react the things that they are fed up with. So that's why, um, yes, geography is a kind of fate and poetry can, I think, change this, this fate for, for, for us, for Turkish people. So, are you bored? No. <laughs> you can, by the way, you can ask questions anytime that you like. I am okay with that. So my other question, my other story, Apart from my parents. Okay, this is the a very uh, short view from Burdur Lake. You can see this lake, and when I was a child, you know, I swam within the lake, and I uh, I talked with the lake, and I'm kind of talking with the objects still, and I'm wondering where my lost bicycle is, and I'm kind of talking still with, with, with the bicycle. Where are you? What are you doing now? So, <laughs> um, and this, this, this lake, um, Burdur is, is located in the Mediterranean region and it is the southern lake district. Um, it is the seventh biggest lake in the country and the third biggest of the salt lakes. So it was formed when waters filled a true shaped tectonic bowl. So it's just like a bowl. And uh, that's why it became a kind of closed basin without any currents. You, we don't have currents there. And it is a habitat for almost 100 species of bird, for some 3,000 water flow, for native species of fish, and countless types of plant. So... Um, Tragically, 31 of the 65 lakes located in the Turkish Lake District uh, have completely dried up. A further 11 of these are threatened by drought and some 1,400,000 hectares of wetland are now arid. So the lakes have, have died and, uh, you know, Environmental solutions are, aren't really being produced and in fact the situation is kind of being ignored and, and this lake has been shrinking since 1978 um, and it is drying up. So from a very close friend of mine, uh, we, we started... Uh, to, to a project together, he was a filmmaker. I, I used was because uh, he committed suicide. So, the, so the, the tragedy of the lake kind of combines with the tragedy of the loss of my very dear friend. So, so I, write, I wrote some pieces, some lyrical essays and some poems that is related with the lake. So I will show you a clip without uh, without uh, uh, the, the the sound because there's the music is so high and it doesn't have to have to be there. But I want you to see how the lake is dying day by day. Oh, not this one. Sorry.
Okay, I think it will come. Okay, uh, first I will show you the teaser of the documentary that we did together. To the lake, we kind of worked with everyone uh, and international artists together and with the people who are living there. Okay, now you will see the last version. You will uh, see how it is dried up day by day, drop by drop. But I will just... Okay, while you are watching, I will write, read you the poem that I wrote. And it is here as the first poem. that is translated into Swedish. Okay, that's me and one of my friends used the camera. He's not a professional, but we try to do our best. Göleyaz. Eski bir gölsem kuytuda azaldıysam gün be gün Uzundur dindiysem, biti verecekmiş olduysam, kök ver, kök ver, kök ver. Sonsuz bir girdapta uyuyorsam, örtük, sözün ve tenin altında. Ağırsam kalbime, susa kaldıysam, dipte, derinde, ses ver. Ses ver, ses ver. Düğüm düğümsem, yorulmuşsam yankıma bakmaktan, gidilmeyene gidiyorsam aklımdan, kuşlar başlayacaksa az sonra, dal ver, dal ver, dal ver. Uzun bir zılgıtsam, beklemiş, gecikmiş, kekre, Ölüyorsam sicim sicim akmaktan can ver, can ver, 
Can ver. Karaysam şimdi kapkara kederden, Kurum tutmuş, tükenmeye durmuşsam, Bitkin düşmüşsem beklemekten, El ver, el ver, el ver. Yes, we can't save the lake, we can't save Shafak. So he committed suicide, by the way. This is his choice. So, but uh, this gives me a kind of urge to to give the voice to this story. So that's why I'm writing. That's why I have this passion for words because I want to share these stories with you as well with other people uh, because here I, I saw uh, the lake Trollion I'm sure I'm not <laughs> sure if I produce it uh, in a correct way but uh, it's it gives me the kind of energy that I I want to give another voice to that girl as well I saw within it and a dog was in an instant uh, started you know swimming together with me and I was so afraid and the the uh, the woman told me oh no don't be afraid she just wants to save you and I don't know if I was swimming horribly but <laughs> and a very short and this dialogue after this document turns out to be a kind of artistic dialogue between me and some musicians. So um, this poem, which gives the title to the documentary, uh, is turned out to be intercomposition. I will just share this with you to have a kind of sense of the language, maybe. Yeah, this is a lemon, so it's... Ought to the lake. If anything, it was the lake that raised me. Yes, mostly it was the lake. Shut away from itself, its waters brackish, its fish washed up on the shore, beginning as it was to dry up. I have always looked for roots, a shelter I could fit into, sometimes turbulent, mostly still. A place that never revealed itself to a mere cursory glance. If I could be anything, I would be a lake. A devotee of the depths, a besieged body of water that lets its own troubles flow back into itself. That took on an acrid taste the more it stood still. That darkened the more it saw, the more it understood. Tell your walls to water, the old people would say, as water will sweep them away, as water is our closest friend, as water never hides its wounds. Tell your walls to that flowing water, let it load them on its back and drive them before it, let it drag them away and topple them into the depths. Instead, I told my walls, to stagnant water, one that had no outlet at all, one that never flowed, one that could take nothing far away. For years I told all to water 
that just stood there, that grieve more bitter, the more it stood, that grieve harder, the more it stood, that sunk deeper to the bottom, the more it stood, that withdrew into itself, the more it stood, to a water that gathers all into it in swirls and eddies, to a lake, to Burdur Lake. I wanted that same lake to give me a voice, to give me roots, to give me a coolness, a promise, a handle to grab, a flowing, warbling desire. And then apart from that, we made a track with my musician friend, Mert Kamiller. So I'm singing in the um, track as well. I want to share it with you. This is the text that I read. Okay, it goes like this and as a, okay, it's a bit sad, but uh, then I want to finish uh, with my last poem and uh, with the full clip for it. Um, it will give you a kind of joy, joy I hope, but the themes are still about soldiers, about wars, about, you know, patriarchal system that kind of kills each other. Uh, first, I want to share the, the rhyme with you. Maybe some of you have heard it before. Al bu takatukaları takatukacıya takatukalatmaya götür takatukacı takatukaları takatukalamam derse takatukacıdan takatukaları takatukalatmadan al da gel. <gülüyor> Do you want to, to, to experience? Do you want to say it? No. A try? <gülüyor> okay. Al bu takatukaları Mehmet, al bu takatukaları takatukacıya götür. Bu beni al Mehmet, al bu beni çayırlara götür. Ben bana ne etsem bilmem ki, ben bana hep bir deniz savaşı Mehmet. Sen bu beni kuşlara, al bu beni varoşlara. Savaş nasılsa bir sırt çantası Mehmet. Hem eskisi olur mu yaranın, sen yine beni bir yastıkta beklet. Elma bile zamanını bekler, sen beni eski bir küpün içine... Derine Mehmet, daha derine. İnsan nasıl bir şenlik seyret. Takatukacı takatukaları takatukalar mı Mehmet? Sen beni en iyisi yoksullara kat. Al bu beni Mehmet, al bu beni. Minareden at. So this poem is... Uh... 
composed by a German composition, German musician, Simin Samavati. She doesn't know any Turkish, but we work together. And uh, please, after watching the clip, uh, don't forget to give me your words. These are the Turkish musicians and this is the clip that they produce. Thank you for sharing this uh, beautiful time with me. Thank you for coming, having me here. Thank you so much. <laughs>